taking time to be here this morning. I really appreciate that. Um, this is the monthly meeting of the Homelessness Planning Council for Metro Davidson County. And I want to do a couple things before we go further. First, I need someone to make a motion uh, to conduct this meeting electronically so that we can do that. And as part of that uh, motion, we will also do the roll call. Um, I motion well, we conduct this meeting electronically. Wendell moves. Makes, well, we, um, wait a minute. Part? We need to use the exact language yeah. out of the agenda. Thank you, Wendell. We need to use. There's a. It's I can do that. All right, go ahead, Elena. All right. I move that the items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this council. Meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans considering the COVID-19 outbreak and any rule conflicting with the governor's executive order permitting electronic meetings be suspended. And we have a second by. Second. second. All right, got a second by Wendell. Okay, thank you, Elena. I'm going to go through and call the roll. Um, and your uh, response should be present and either yay or nay on the motion. All right, so let's get started. Elena Boyer. Present, yay. April Calvin. Present, yay. Ashley Oswald. Ryan Ellis. Present, yay. Alex Smith. Present, yay. Michelle Hall. Present. Yay. Yes. Thanks, Michelle. Brian has. That was Brian? Yes. yes. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Don Dean. Uh, Norman Humber. I think Norman's maybe joining us at about nine, I think is what I saw in an email somewhere. Uh, Catherine Knowles. Present. Yay. Thank you, Catherine. Sheila Decker. Present, yay. Mark Overlock. Present, yay. Mary Catherine Rand. Present, yay. Beth Shin. Present, yay. Freddie O'Connell. All right, Aaron Evans. Sandra Sepulveda. Will Connolly. Present, yay. Paula Foster, present, yay. Laura Bermudez. Present, yes. Uh, Vicki Batcher. I think Vicki is here. Present, yay. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> Michael Seagroves. Present, yay. Uh, Jeff Gibson. Carl Strobel. Charlie's on. I see you. you Got to unmute yourself, Charlie. All right, Charlie, we'll come back to you. Tom Turner. Present. Yes. All right. We have non voting members. Uh, I believe Renee Pratt. Does Renee have a proxy here? Uh, Reva Gilligan. Reva on. And I believe Hannah Davis is here from the mayor's office. All right. Thank you all very, very much. Clearly that motion passes. Uh, it'd be kind of funny if it didn't, right? Okay. So before we go any further, there is another thing that we need to do. Um, I need to ask if anyone has any conflict of interest particularly related to any agenda items that you were sent. Um, if so, would you please state them now? Hey, this is Mark Overlock. Uh, to the extent Catholic Charities is going to get any aid from the city or otherwise for homeless uh, advocacy, I, my wife works for Catholic Charities, so I have a potential conflict. Thank you. Any others? Hey, Paula, this is Sheila Decker. Hey, Sheila. Hi, um, I wanted to mention I may have a conflict of interest as a contract vendor for the Salvation Army. Okay, thank you very much. 
Thank you. Any others? Hey, Paula, this is April. I um, just want to state that the Salvation Army is a funded program through the CLC. Okay. Others? Hi, Paula, this is Mary Catherine. Um, I work for the Mary Parish Center and we receive CLC and ESG funding. Okay. okay. Others? Michelle Hall and from the Oasis Center and we receive COC funding. Okay. Are there any others? Uh, Tom Turner with the Downtown Partnership. Uh, we've applied for uh, ESG funding and uh, been granted ESG funding for um, CARES Act. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> Congratulations, Tom. Hey, this is Will Conley. Um, I'm at Park Center now and we receive ESG funding as well. Okay. Are there any others? Going through the list. Not seeing anybody else, but I think Charlie. Well, Charlie and room at the end. Not sure if Charlie can get off mute at the moment, but Charlie, I, I said that for you. Um, and I will tell you all uh, two things. One, my uh, wife works for National Cares and they receive ESG funding. Uh, and, 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 Who that is. All right. Um, hi, you must be Jeff. <laughs> hi, I, 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 I'm having. Uh, Jeff, do you, do you have multiple windows open with the uh, with with WebEx? That would cause that problem. I'm not getting any volume through my computer. All right, Jeff's going to work on that and we're going to keep on. The second thing that I want to say to you all, um, this is not a current conflict because they are not currently funded. However, I have just uh, accepted the position of executive director at Open Table Nashville and we'll be transitioning to that uh, position at the end of this month. So just wanted to share that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. I'm very excited. Same. Very excited. Um, so they are not currently funded. However, uh, they are clearly uh, very involved in service provision here in Nashville. So I wanted you all to know that. All right, so that is that. There are uh, one other thing before we move on. Uh, I want to welcome all of our new uh, members to uh, the Planning Council. We have some mayoral appointees. First is Jeff Gibson. He's a, an attorney with Bassberry and Sims. He's served on the board of Room at the End. Um, he currently serves on the board at Room at the End. Uh, which would then make give that a conflict of interest. There you go, Jeff took care of that. Um, the Metro Human Relations Commission, and he has been part of the Tennessee Justice Center Board of Directors. Uh, we appreciate you coming. You bring with us a, to us a world of experience, and we, we're glad you're here. And we hope you get that audio fixed soon so we can hear from you. All right. Um, next, we have Vicki Batcher. Vicki uh, is coming to us as a writer uh, and vendor for the contributor. Um, She's very excited to serve on the Homelessness Planning Council, and we're very happy to have her. She plans to be involved in the Consumer Advisory Board, um, which is chaired by another new member, uh, Sheila Becker, who we introduced, I think, last month. So thank you all very much, Sheila, for being here. And last but certainly not least, someone who is familiar to each and every one of us. Um, I'm not sure how he got on this, this commission or this board. <laughs> I'm not sure how he decided he would actually do it. Uh, but Will Connolly, welcome back. Uh, to our midst. We appreciate you being willing to uh, come back and help us out. You clearly bring a whole lot of historical knowledge uh, to this body and uh, congratulations on your, your new gig at Park Center. Uh, that's a, a huge thing and wish you well. So thanks very much for being here. Last thing I need to make an announcement on is uh, the mayor's office, uh, Mayor Cooper has uh, officially appointed a liaison to this planning council. Uh, it is Hannah Davis. Hannah is the uh, Affordable Housing Program Director working with the Barnes Fund. Uh, so she is segueing uh, and bringing that uh, knowledge and experience to us as our liaison to the mayor's office. And we are uh, eternally grateful for that uh, selection and really look forward to working with Hannah. Uh, she's been on a couple of calls already and uh, I think it's gonna be a great, gonna be a great thing. So thank you and welcome Hannah. 
All right. Thank anyone, you. Glad to be here, of course. Thank you, Hannah. Appreciate that. All right. Um, does anyone have any other uh, welcome announcements or anything that they would like to, to make before we move on? All right. Um, I hear none. As we as we do, uh, we want to make sure that we take a moment out of what we do uh, in our busy, busy time to recognize that there are still folks who are living on the streets uh, who live in conditions that are not meant to be lived in, and sometimes those things lead to uh, an untimely passing. So we want to recognize and remember those that we have lost this past month uh, or since the last time that we met. I have four names, and I'm going to read those names, and if anyone else has any others that they know of, I'd like you to please share those with us. But the first is Alvin Dwayne Anderson, Earl Peaks, Ontario Simpson, and Rodney McCoy. Are there any others that anyone knows of? All right. I would like us to take a moment and remember those. Thank you all very much for that. Um, we're going to move on with our agenda. And the first thing on our agenda this morning is the Homeless Impact Division and MDHA updates. So, uh, Judy, would you like to start? Yes, good morning. And I need to make sure you can hear me because I've had a technical issue. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, good. So, um, in my report today, you're going to get a report like you do it now monthly uh, in writing after the meeting, uh, so by the end of the week. But I want to highlight and focus on encampments. Um, there is especially the three large encampments, and, and two encampments have a lot of focus. Uh, we get a lot of neighborhood calls uh, everywhere in Metro about those two encampments. One, of course, is the Jefferson Street Bridge. And there are currently about 60-plus uh, people, and that is up from uh, around 40 this spring. And so one of the things um, I have called, and, and I think it was reported last time, we called and had uh, outreach meetings just on this encampment with the providers that are serving under there. So services have been increasing, and the service providers um, are planning a, a, an event to really focus on getting people into housing. And you hear more, I'm not going into um, the CARES funds, you're going to hear that on another agenda item, what the plans are there. But it's really getting um, the Salvation Army uh, is a lead agency and there has already started making sure people are in, court, in the coordinated entry process, HMAS, uh, those are requirements for the ESG funding. Um, mental health club is regularly down there. I'm in touch with the bridge ministry. And uh, the service event is really also, for, it's, it's planned for September 24th now. And it is looking at bringing all the providers together at one time. We're looking at closing the, the street right before, uh, right there next to the encampment. Um, and, and then just really honing in on what is missing. What do people need? Um, in paperwork, in are they missing IDs, what needs to be worked on for people. And then also bring in uh, neighborhood health. Um, Brian Hill and I spoke, he's already starting now to offer, um, he's in encampments, uh, has started doing COVID testing in encampments, and he will focus starting this week um, offering um, testing under Jefferson Street Bridge. I have been very, um, with the service providers for the Jeff about the Jefferson Street Bridge encampment. 
it's too many people in a too tight space. For COVID pandemic, it's really not, um, I, I have huge concerns about that. I'm, uh, I made a call for nonprofits um, to help identify spaces, even at churches, somewhere where, where um, two, three, five people can pitch a tent and, and we then know where they are and can continue services. The service providers can do that. I'm in touch actually already with one um, church to move a few people from under there. We just need to decompress that encampment. It's very urgent uh, to do so. So there is a lot going on there, a big focus on what can we do to move people out and move them to um, realistic, healthy space as we work on housing. Um, the second encampment is um, the Lowe's encampment, Brookmead encampment off Charlotte Pike. There are about 40 people there. Um, Metro Water Services had um, reached out to me in early July, uh, saying there's some construction coming on. They have a pumping water pumping station there. They have some major construction uh, starting uh, next Monday. We have been in touch since July with main service providers just to t tell them this is coming. And as soon as we had dates um, about when construction would start, um, that has been uh, continuously provided to service providers and to the people living there. The con contractor and Metro Water Services have been out meeting with people. Um, two weeks ago, flyer has been set out, and yesterday was actually a community meeting just for the people that are in that encampment, if they have any questions and what's going on, and mapping out the affected areas uh, for construction. Um, so I just wanted everybody to be aware. We also, I'm in touch with um, three council members in that area that their neighborhoods are, are affected and where the complaints come from. Uh, one had a community meeting last night, which went actually pretty well. We gave a lot of background information on that metro that we are all working together on and focusing on housing. That's our plan. That's what we're looking for for people to, to get people into housing as quickly as possible and what we can do with the CARES funding about that. The third one is Old Tent City. And there are about uh, up to 90 people. Um, there is a new, there, there is um, People Loving Nashville has really been uh, taking the lead on that one. Um, there are multiple providers in all of those, but frankly, this, I have one main um, organization that made each, it's three different organizations, each has the main focus on these encampments and, and I stay regularly in touch with them about um, how many people are there, what's going on, uh, and, and everybody's working towards housing and looking and applying, seeing if they can apply for um, ESG dollars for housing. Um, also, the downtown um, precinct, police precinct, they have um, uh, designated a quality of life unit that works closely with the Salvation Army. I had a really, really great meeting with uh, Chief John Drake, the interim police chief, who is very, he made it very clear to me. Um, and by the way, he had contacted me on his first day on the job um, that he really doesn't want, he wants to work with social service agencies. How can, how can police better work with uh, what can they do? What what innovative approaches can be happening? He he does not want to arrest people, and I also want to stress there are several commanders that have reached out, and um, I've seen and heard them in community meetings stating that homelessness is not a crime. You know, when there are complaints, um, they are really trying to distinguish between behavior or or activity um, that is illegal, and not just because somebody is upset that somebody's homeless in their backyard, kind of that, that approach. So I think there are really great conversations going on. And with one of the other areas where a lot of complaints are coming is uh, just generally in downtown. Um, COVID has really made homelessness more visible. The numbers have not yet increased to a point where we can say, oh, there's a huge increase in homelessness but definitely, definitely more visible. And when you think about public libraries are closed, day centers, while they're still operating, they change their service models. So people are not indoors as much or have places to go indoors. Even agencies, the waiting rooms, they're not 
full. You can't just sit there and wait uh, at the same level. So what are people supposed to do? They're going to be outside. And so it's really, really become uh, very visible. And um, then, so we, we're just all in this together. So one of the things, we have all the conversations going on, and thanks to Will Connolly, who's taking the lead at Park Center, um, Tom Turner, Chief Drake, um, and then I have a group of downtown churches I'm talking with as well to focus on a specific downtown outreach, what that needs to look like um, to make a difference. Um, right now, there is not a designated um, outreach team for the downtown area. And the reality is it pre and post and during the pandemic or before the pandemic, um, downtown, that's just where people go for services. That's where, where a lot of people are visible. So what do we need to do to address that in a designated way? So those are the conversations um, around um, the outreach that I wanted to share with you and what are some of the things going on. And um, then I wanted to also lead into um, the strategic plan and just give an update there. Um, I have been, the executive committee had asked me to look at the tasks that were assigned to them in the strategic plan and uh, making recommendations how to move forward with that. So I've done that and we had really a good conversation about we need to pick up where we left off in February. So in January, and I really want to shout out to Laura Bermuda that really, really has helped a whole lot. She has, she has been the chair of the former strategic planning committee. And in January, she helps facilitate committee chairs that come together and really look and understand what their tasks are in the strategic plan and work towards that. The whole, we, there, there's a whole concept and, and plan and process that she put together on how the strategic plan is going to be reported on in each homelessness planning council meeting, how committees uh, report out progress, and how um, our work is really centered and aligned with that strategic plan so that it's a, it's a live document. Um, so we, we started that reporting first in February, and then for obvious reasons, it just didn't continue. So um, I just wanted to report to watch for this is going to be uh, picked back up. And um, that's what uh, also the executive committee fully agreed on. There is one specific issue that they're looking at uh, that's their task is to annually review what the progress is and what needs to, if there are any updates that need to happen to develop a process for that and look at that. And that's kind of the work moving forward. So you need to, yeah, stay tuned for more updates and the real uh, strategic planning focus on each meeting. And that's my report. Thank you, Judy, very much. Susie, do you have a report for us? I do. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, the continue of care competition still has not begun. There are weekly uh, calls by the leadership in DC and um, they do not have a date when that competition is going to open. What they would like very much to do this year is to make it a very simple process and not go through the typical rigmarole. They will, as, my under, as I understand it, they're going to have to get congressional approval to simplify it, to just do a, a straight renewal project kind of uh, theme. And um, the HEROES Act, there is language, if that passes, to give HUD approval to do that simplification. If it doesn't pass, though, they're going to have to get it some other way, but they certainly are sort of urging the Congress to make this process as simple as possible for fiscal 2020 funds. We're looking at about $5.7 million of renewal projects. It is typically a little over $3 million, and that is increased as a result of the big YHDP, the Homeless Youth Demonstration Grant that we got that went to Oasis Center. Um, it, when that competition is announced, I'll be sure and send something out to the listserv to let you all know. Um, the, a number of the committees have begun to sort of restart their engines, anticipating no end <laughs> to virtual meeting land. Uh, the point in time subcommittee of data has met. The data committee is meeting uh, quite a bit. Uh, you'll hear about the data committee's workforce report later on in today's meeting. 
um, the performance evaluation committee, which is usually very, very busy way before now, looking at the performance of the various renewal projects is going to meet this afternoon, um, just anticipating even if, uh, under the simple process that they do need to review the performance of all of the funded projects and make sure that those projects are aware about how they're coming along on this performance metric. Um, the HMIS advisory committee, um, Rachel Cook's been leading that along with Freddie very ably. The membership committee has revved its engines lately and um, has a meeting coming up. And uh, the charter committee, as Paul well knows, um, finished its work and um, took a breather and needs to then reconvene to look over policies and procedures that we've never really sort of uh, tackled and they need to be pulled out of that charter document. So that is probably going to start up in the next, I would say, month or so. Um, if you got any questions, just let me know. And, and with, with these reports, it, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking out loud. I'm not sure there will be a real need to have the COC general meeting next Thursday. So I'll talk with staff at the Homeless Impact Division and some other folks to see whether or not that there is a real need for that. If you've got any input on that, I'd appreciate it. So that's all I have for this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. <clears throat> and just an FYI, that uh, charter committee is going to be looking for a new chairperson. Uh, so I think it's a, <laughs> I know Susie's laughing. Um, so just put that in your in your head and we may be reaching out to someone to, to see about taking that on at some point. All right. Um, here we go. So the next thing on our agenda is, uh, Strategic plan, Judy. You kind of did that. That's pretty much it. Yeah, yes, I added that to my report. So, okay. So, working on the strategic plan, we're in a good place where it's just time to pick back up where we kind of had a stalling uh, out after at the beginning of the pandemic. So, uh, we're going to do what we can to get that moving again. Hey, Paul, right. this is Mark Overlook. I hate to interrupt. Hey, Mark. That's okay. Derek Smith. Our Metro attorney has not been did not get an invite to the meeting. So I don't know if Philip can route him one. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, what's his, uh, what's his name? It's Derek Smith. It's just, uh, in, of course, Nashville.gov. D E R R I C K dot Smith at Nashville.gov. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay. no problem. I'll get on it. All right. Also want to uh, recognize that our council members, Aaron Evans and Sandra Sepulveda have joined us today. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you guys. Um, okay, so, uh, all right, coordinated entry policy and procedure manual. Who's gonna do that, Judy? Sally, me. Hey, Sally. Hello. Thanks for being here. Hey, everyone. Uh, no problem. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sally Lott. I'm the coordinated entry manager at the homeless impact division. I introduced the CE evaluation at the last planning council meeting and it was sent out. So I hope everyone has had a chance to look over it. I'm going to be going over again briefly the recommendations that came out of that evaluation and then I'm going to be going over the updated policies and procedures manual and the comments received so that then it can um, vote to be approved. So um, the recommendations from the eval first, the recommendations are divided up into the four elements of coordinated entry, which are access assessment, prioritization, and referral. I know we have some new planning council members here today. So if you ever um, have any questions about coordinated entry, the process in general, what it looks like in Nashville, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm always available for a phone conversation, email, um, text, whatever you want to do. Um, and also old planning council members as well. I'm also here for um, any type of conversation. The report also uh, provides some context for the elements as well. So just to get into it, um, the recommendations around coordinated entry access are to have increased after hours access for all populations, a designated centralized access point for individuals, increased accessibility for people with disabilities and for people who don't speak English, broader geographic coverage of the county, specifically the more rural areas of the county, and then also CE access at the main shelter providers. Um, for assessment, the assessment tool that we use in our community is the VI SPDAT and the recommendation for 
um, assessment is to further study assessment tools and the VI Cadet specifically around its cultural responsiveness and race. And we actually, the stakeholder group specifically recommends that the planning council task the standards of care committee with this further evaluation of the VI Cadet and its role in our community. Around prioritization, the recommendation is to undertake a more comprehensive discussion around the future of the community's priorities and our prioritization of resources. And then the specific recommendation to the planning council from that was to, again, task the standards of care committee with this work. And then for referrals, um, the recommendations are to integrate prevention resources fully into coordinated entry to increase community buy-in and participation in housing first to require COC and ESG funded agencies to accept all referrals through coordinated entry to evaluate our referral rates and how to improve our referral acceptance rates and to use care coordination meetings to actively refer people to available resources. And then specific recommendations to the planning council were to uh, for the planning council to task the performance evaluation committee with holding COC and ESG funded agencies um, adherence to the coordinated entry policies and procedures, and then also to recommend that the planning council create the resource development committee as outlined in the strategic plan and to continue to advocate for an increased amount of housing first resources in our community. I also think it's important to add that we, um, the CE team here at the Homeless Impact Division, we're currently working with HUD TA to continue to scale up coordinated entry so that the process in our community is prepared for the future influx of the ESG CARES Act funding. Um, coordinated entry is continuing to become more flexible and more dynamic, and so we're going to be incorporating the information and feedback that was obtained through the evaluation into this ramping up process that we are embarking on and participating in. Um, before I move into the comments on the policies and procedures manual, I just want to make sure um, anyone had any questions around the evaluation and the recommendations. Again, feel free to um, reach out to me if you do. Um, okay, so moving on to the updated policies and procedures manuals. We distributed it for a 30-day public comment period, and we did receive two public comments, and I'm going to go over those. Um, the comments were brought back to the CE stakeholder group for discussion, and I'll share um, the stakeholder group's response to the comments as well. So the first comment is from Jesse Call at Salvation Army, and his comment read that the CE prioritizations for families should include prioritization to the shelters willing to accept them for couples without children, including same gender couples, intergenerational families, two parent families, all still based on VI FIDET scores, and that this be recommend, uh, recommends that this be added to the policies and procedures. This was brought to the stakeholder group, and the group decided and thought that these larger scale potential changes to eligibility and prioritization should involve more community input. And as I mentioned earlier, the Standards of Care Committee has been tasked to engage in widespread community input to further involve, uh, engage with our current prioritization protocol. Um, and so we believe this comment fits into that scope of work. And also prioritization is being discussed in our work with HUD TA. So um, that's the first comment. The second public comment came from Steve Ryder, and his comment reads, this document has serious deficiencies. There needs to be one section that lists a clear and concise policy statement regarding the release of information. After the policy is put forward, then you can list the procedures and processes on how that policy is implemented. There are numerous sections in which the topic of the release of information is mentioned, and it is unnecessarily confusing. One particular section mentions a verbal release, which is rather problematic. If a client refuses to sign the release of information, that means there is no consent. A caseworker cannot be authorized to submit documentation that the client has not given explicit permission. Also, the client could feel quite uncomfortable signing their release of information when it is not clear how widely distributed that information may become available. There needs to be greater disclosure about who gets access to their information. So this comment was also discussed by the stakeholder group and was brought to Rachel Cook, the HMIS administrator. 
the stakeholder group did decide to add some clarifying language around the verbal release of information to the manual. A client is able to give consent verbally. Wordage was added to the manual that if a verbal release of information is initially obtained, a written release of information must be obtained when there is no longer a danger or health risk present. This wordage is consistent with the content of the HMIS user trainings and the HMIS policies and procedures. Also, the CE manual states that all agencies entering data into the CE provider in HMIS must abide by the HMIS policies and procedures, and those have extensive language around consent and release, release of information. So those are the two public comments and how the stakeholder group addressed them. If anyone has any questions, feel free to um, shout them out. And then if not, the next step would be a vote for approval, I believe. Ms. Sally, this is Alex Smith. Um, Hi. My, it's a, basically the same question, but vice versa. A person can give a verbal consent, but doesn't want to sign a paper, but then they can also change mm -hmm. their mind to sign the paper for the release of information, but verbally doesn't want to talk to anybody. How do we work with that system? So, the, if they signed a, or verbally consented, but then did not want to sign, and then, sorry, what was the second scenario? If they signed, but they physically doesn't consent. want to talk to them. Yes. Because sometimes um, people can say, yes, I want this help. And yes, I mm -hmm. give consent, but they don't want to sign on a dotted line. Or they decide on a dotted line, but then they think about it and they don't feel trustworthy enough for the person mm -hmm. that's doing it to give them that permission. Well, and, okay, and we do have um, policies and procedures in place around if someone um, has consented previously and then withdraws that consent, we do have policies and procedures and how that person can still be served. And the same thing, if someone does not consent to be entered into HMILS, we also have policies and procedures in the manual of how that person can still be served. Okay, thank you. So, make a comment in uh, relationship to Jesse's comment about uh, family configurations that uh, about one in six of the people found outside uh, during the point in time count were in family configurations that couldn't easily be served uh, in our shelter system. Uh, the most common was uh, partners uh, or spouses, but also adult children. Um, and there is a procedure in the policies manual, which I'm, I'm pleased to see, to uh, allow appeals around additions of family members, uh, but just to kind of second that as a comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Beth. Are there other comments or questions? This is Mark. I am uh, coming a little late to the game. I uh, have some syntax edits that change no substance. So uh, maybe I can work with Sally after we and uh, if you Sally, if you just send it to me as a Word document, it's just little little stuff, subject verb agreement, uh, semicolons here and there. And then I really need my name in bold in all the uh, photos. <laughs> Mark is uh, Mark is our uh, resident editor, uh, so I think that that is fine. That is fine. Hey Sally, it's Will. What's up? Okay, sorry. Hope I'm not echoing. Hey, um, it's good to see you. Uh, <laughs> the um, how many? Um, what's the percentage of providers that are receiving CSC funding? Um, yeah, like how many are participating in CE right now? Like getting housing, like filling their units, their CSC funded units for CE. Is it 100 percent or is it less? Uh, um, I would believe it's 100 percent, and I think that particip the um, amount of participation varies, and like what participation look like can vary. Um, whether it's like being an access point or being an agency that accepts referrals, being an agency that makes, you know, makes referrals. So um, I think sometimes the amount of participation can vary. 
Okay, thanks. Okay. thanks. My, my thought there was um, if there's a need to require a um, like an agreement, or if you already have one, that's, that's cool, but some sort of <clears throat> agreement between the housing provider and uh, and the CE uh, process, I guess that would be uh, the impact of it. Um, just outlining their responsibility to to fill their housing referrals through the CE process, or if we have something something like that that holds um, that clearly defines the the roles and responsibilities among the parties, and 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 make sure that we're uh, that providers are are agreeing to fill their units through CE, at least the CFC and, and ESG funded providers. Okay, thanks, Will. Hello. Charlie, I, 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 I think you're trying to Hello. so go ahead. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Uh, Sally, first of all, thank you for all that you've done to clarify this issue. But could you give an example somebody who has, who has resistance to um, releasing and signing a release of information. Does, it seems like uh, there's, a, there's a lot of... All right, Charlie, you're, you're going on and off of mute. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, go ahead. Uh, Sally, if somebody is scared about releasing the information, what do you say to, to, to help them overcome that? Sure, I think, and um, you know, for anyone that's working with someone that's going to provide the release of information, sorry, I know there's an echo. Um, taking the time to fully go over uh, taking the time to fully go over the release of information with someone, really walking them through it, explaining exactly what HMIS is, exactly what it's used for, um, just making sure that person knows, um, you know, who is seeing the information, where it's going, and that all agencies that are participating take the confidentiality and security of their information very seriously. And that's something we really stress in our HMIS trainings is that this is very important information um, and that it's up to all of us to safeguard it. And so I think kind of having that discussion with someone um, and just being there to answer any questions, um, in my experience, has been the best way to kind of make someone maybe seem more comfortable um, if they were having kind of doubts before. Um, and again, explaining um, the option of um, what it would look like if they didn't consent. Um, but I truly think just like really taking the time with someone to explain what they're consenting to and why um, can really help with someone's comfort level. Sally, I can jump in on that if um, that would be helpful too. Thanks, Rachel. Sure. Yeah, so um, with the release, um, with the new release of information that we recently published and then the um, accompanying public privacy notice, um, they list out the uses and disclosures that are allowed by HUD for that um, client information that's entered into HMIS. So like Sally said, um, we do go over those documents in our user trainings. Um, and then also we do um, stress to the client that not signing that release will not um, stop them from receiving services and also um, remind them that if they're more comfortable using an alias or something like that, um, that's also allowed. Um, so there are um, plenty of workarounds and we um, continue to stress the importance of um, client data privacy. Thank you, Rachel. So one of the things, Charlie, that, I, that I've heard and I, I hear it and I know it uh, to be true it is Informed consent is probably one of the most important things that, that our frontline uh, 
outreach workers and other staff uh, can can understand as they are working with our folks. So if there is ever if there's ever concern uh, that that folks are not uh, providing that informed consent, then I think that is something that we can look at uh, as a whole for our community in terms of a retraining to make sure. And I, and I know that that's part of the HMIS training. And I know that each individual agency talks about informed consent when, when they're working with folks, but it is critical. And I think that all of the issues and questions that you guys have had um, can be addressed through making sure that all of our outreach workers and all of our frontline staff um, have a really good understanding of informed consent, what it means, and how to work with our, our, our folks uh, around those issues. Are there any other questions? Elena, I have, yeah, I have a quick question. Um, and this might be just my lack of experience in being a housing navigator or boots on the ground, but I was wondering if you can expand a little bit in the trainings area. I was looking at the housing network trainings that's available, and I was wondering, and it might be embedded in the ones that are listed in the document itself, um, but in terms of the the staff or the policies and procedures, are there specific trainings that are focused on harm reduction, trauma-informed care, substance use, and how to interact with that population? I'm assuming they're embedded in the ones that are existing, but just a really concentrated focus on those. Um, is that, you guys might be getting that training already, just kind of curious. I don't see it really kind of explicitly listed. I know for the housing navigator training that I offer with coordinated entry, it really is kind of focused more on kind of the nitty gritty details of, um, you know, the coordinated entry resources, specifically how to apply for them, that kind of thing. Um, but I think um, at least on all agency levels, I know like when um, for like having the community have access to those types, those types of trainings, I know like the homeless coalition would, you know, work on providing those. Um, also during the navigator meetings. So that isn't specifically um, gone into depth in my navigator training, but I do agree that it's important like to have those as like ongoing education for navigators in our community, for sure. Thank you. Judy Tackett, did you have your hand up? Do you want to say something? Yes, uh, I really want to remind everybody that we have a two sets of technical assistance provider from HUD um, that are both working with, one is specifically for HMAS. Uh, um, the other one, Heather Dillashaw is actually on this call, um, uh, working on us to, with us to really look and, and um, what the systems improvement uh, is including. That includes really looking at our policies and looking at um, flow charting out how, how the system moves, how can we encourage all the providers to utilize uh, these processes that we have in place and improve up on that. Um, we're looking at everything and these are ongoing conversations. Um, I just also want to uh, really shout out to Sally and her team, Hannah and Al, <laughs> uh, to really all the work they put in um, with um, stakeholders to review and really work hard over the next uh, last few months um, uh, and, and align these documents and really look at what hard requirements are. And from a um, the, the client-centered uh, perspective on this is super important to us as well. So um, this is a working progress. This is a, a huge um, step forward. And we I just want to really remind everybody we do utilize every um, expertise and support we can get on this. All right. Any other questions? Or comments? I, have a, I have a question. I have a question. This is Michelle. Michelle. Go ahead, Michelle. I'm sorry that got okay. Hi, Sally. Um, first, let me just say thank you so much for all the work. I think this is amazing, and just seeing how this has developed over the last five or six years, like. It seems like a lot of progress. Um, so my question is kind of around the area of prioritization and one of your public comments might have kind of hit on this area, but how would we start talking about if we wanted to talk about people who are transgender as an area that might be prioritized and if not into shelter because a lot of our shelters are shelters, there's not a lot of shelters in CE right now, but if maybe prioritizing them for rapid rehousing? 
Right, and those are the type of conversations that we thought would be um, important for the standards of care committee to take on um, because for just so everyone is um, caught up, our current prioritization protocol is the VI SPDAT as the base and then extra prioritization points added for um, specifically in response to COVID-19, whether you're unsheltered, age 55 or older, or have an underlying health condition that puts you at a more severe uh, risk for complications, and then length of time homelessness as a tiebreaker. So that's kind of what it is now. Um, but we appreciate that there are other um, ideas in the community around prioritization, and that's why we thought um, tasking the standards of care with having that ongoing conversation and getting more community input would be valuable. Um, because it's such a um, large community decision that we thought um, it just could use more focus and more discussion and have more stakeholders um, to weigh in. Thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Hey, this is Will again. Just uh, um, there's a, uh, a bad link on page 13. <laughs> It's like the bottom of page 13, um, the last link, uh, but otherwise looks great. And just to clarify my other comment, we'll get on um, that. <laughs> just to clarify my other comment, um, I feel like it'd be helpful to have a partner agreement between the impact division mm -hmm. and it, really any agency that's participating, whether it's housing navigation or actually providing a housing resource. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, I think I think the policies are, are uh, approvable and, and look great right now, but just something to maybe work on if we don't have it yet. Yeah. Thanks, Will. You know, and I want to remind folks that, you know, these these documents are are living and breathing. And as we pass them and go forward, we live with them and realize that some things are working really, really well and some things need to be tweaked a little bit. There is always the opportunity to go back and review uh, based on our experience and add, subtract, uh, fine tune. Um, these are not things that should be passed and then put on a shelf. These are things that we should utilize in our work every day. So uh, thank you all for your input. Are there any others before we move on? I'd like to, to try to wrap this part up so we can move on in the interest of time, but I don't want to stifle any input. Just one good? clarification. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. I'm presuming all of this has passed legal authority. And right, our, the team has a legal representative. Has this been vetted by Metro Legal? Whatever, uh, whatever legal authority, HUD. Yes. Yes. I said yes. Sally did. Okay, Sally. Thank you, Sally. All right, then. Are there any other comments, questions, concerns? Kudos. I'd like to say that the committee has done a fabulous job and uh, Michelle, I think you're right. This is this has been a long time coming over the last several years, and and we continue to develop. And I think we're we are moving in the right direction slowly, uh, sometimes more slower more slowly than we'd like, but uh, we are moving forward. And I I really appreciate everyone's hard work. So if there are no further questions concerns, we're going to go down and do a roll call vote. Uh, I'll I'll take care of that. Please. Uh, when I call your name, unmute yourself and say yay or nay, or you may abstain if you would like. So let's get started. Elena Boyer. Yay. Uh, April Calvin. Yay. Uh, Ashley Oswald is not with us. Ryan Ellis. Yes. Alex Smith. Alex, you still with us? Yay. I'm here. Thank you. Michelle Hall. Yay. Uh, Brian. Yay. Uh, Dawn's not with us. Norman is not with us. Uh, Catherine Knowles. I'm with Ms. Paula. Oh, hey, Norman's here. Norman, you want to vote? Welcome. I would abstain because I don't know what we're voting on. Abstention. Okay. 
Thanks, Norman. Uh, <laughs> Captain Knight. Yay. Sheila Decker. Yay. Mark Overlock. I approve, and if we didn't have a motion for approval, I so move. It was moved by the committee. Mark, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mary Catherine Rand. Yay. Beth Shen. Yay. Freddie's not with us? Nope. Uh, uh, Aaron Evans. Yes. Sandra Sepulveda. Aye. Will Connolly. All Foster's yay. Laura Bermudez. Yes. Vicki Batcher. Yes. Wendell Seagrove. Hey. Is that a yes, Wendell? Yes. Thank you. Jeff Gibson. I am staying only because I have not been involved in the process at this point. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Charles Strobel. Charlie? Yes. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Tom, Turner. Tom Turner. Yes. All right. So it passes with two extensions. No, no opposition. Thank you very much. Charlie, you want to put yourself back on? There you go. Thank you. All right. Really appreciate that. Uh, next on our agenda is an update on the emergency solution grants and the CARE Act. I believe Heather Dillashaw from our technical assistance is here. Heather, are you going to do that for us or is that? That's, hey, Paul, uh, it's going to be me and Shelly from MDHA. Hey, Shelly. Thanks for being here. All right. Take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to give just a really brief overview and then and then hand it over to Shelly. So the <clears throat> there are various working groups um, that are continuing to move uh, implementation of the $10 million forward. The, as you, I think, are all aware, the first allocation of a million and a half has uh, been awarded and we're working on applications for the second round, which is uh, around 8 million. Um, and so those there are working groups set up uh, the rapid rehousing work group um, an outreach work group uh, thinking about how those rapid rehousing and outreach dollars will be used in the second round. Um, those both of those groups. One meets today and one tomorrow, I think. Um, so those groups are moving forward. Uh, we're also continuing to work on landlord engagement strategies um, and potentially what a, a more comprehensive centralized landlord engagement model might look like uh, in Nashville. Continuing to meet weekly with the leadership group that includes representation from this body, uh, from the Consumer Advisory Board, uh, from the Mayor's Office, from MDHA, and from the Homeless Impact Division uh, to continue to track progress and make sure that everybody's in the loop. Um, so that work continues daily. Um, I'm super grateful for the collaborations that are emerging. Um, it's pretty exciting to see Nashville step up um, to really utilize these dollars in the most effective way to house your folks that haven't been able to access housing before. Um, so. Really exciting to see that. Um, that's kind of the high level overview about where we are right now and it all continues to move. Um, Shelly, I will turn it to you for some details around the funding and the pre-application meeting and all those things. I don't know what number she's calling in on. I don't think she's, I think she's a call in participant. Philip. What's the user's last name? It's what? Shelly Fugit, Fugit, and she's listed on our panelists. Oh. Can I you just unmuted her. Yes. Yes, yes. I can hear you. Go ahead, Shelly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, so, yeah, so we um, we had the RFA out for the second funding allocation, um, um, and it's due on September 18th. Um, we will have a pre-application meeting via WebEx um, tomorrow at 11 a.m. to go over some details for that. Um, so just kind of a FY as far as what's been released, we, um, the first round of funding that we received, the 1.5 million, we had released an RFA for that, um, that pretty much included all eligible ESG activities in that RFA. Um, we have um, made the recommendations for awards and notified the agencies that were awarded those funds. Um, what we did in that round, because we put that RFA out before we, um, or 
right, right around the time we were getting the second allocation. And we later learned from HUD that those buckets of money would be combined into one account in, in our IDA system. So because of that, um, and because of the level of requests that we received in round one, what we did was we um, funded um, about 16, uh, no, I think it was 13 or 14 agencies that requested money through round one. We had about uh, six that we could not fund because they did not meet the minimum score uh, to be funded um, with our application. Um, but of those that were funded, um, in order to um, utilize the funds the most uh, strategically, what we did is pretty much requests that were for um, shelter operations and shelter essential services, um, prevention, um, and some outreach were all funded through that 1.5 million bucket. Um, then also what we did because we had the extra funding, we funded the rapid rehousing request from the second allocation. So what that will mean is um, we actually funded about $3 million um, worth of grant requests through the first RFA. Um, in the pre-application meeting tomorrow, we will adjust the total numbers for what's actually available for round two after that those adjustments have been made. Um, the round two RFA um, is focused primarily on rapid rehousing and street outreach um, requests. Um, to that end, um, we have notified um, agencies that were awarded uh, rapid rehousing or street outreach in round one. They have the option, instead of having to go through and complete a whole new application on Zoom grant, they have the option to submit an adjusted, uh, an, a second budget and extra detail about capacity needs, staffing, et cetera if they want to increase their ask for rapid rehousing and street outreach only. Um, so we will be detailing those that information in our pre-application meeting tomorrow as well. Um, because we just felt like the application is essentially the same and we did not feel like it was necessary to have agencies submit a full application again as in grants. Certainly any uh, agencies that did not apply the first time can apply to resume grants for the second round. Any agencies that did not get funding through the first round can apply again um, through Zoom grants for the second round. Again, but that second round is pretty much focused on rapid rehousing and street outreach only. We're not doing um, um, shelter operations or prevention in that second round funding. So we will have updated uh, total numbers for what amount is available because we have to back out about 1.3 million from that bucket from what we funded um, with the round one request. Um, again, that's due September 18th. Um, we also have pending um, recommendations for the regular 2020 ESG funding that we've done uh, recommendations for awards for that. So that's pending. So as soon as we have that finalized, we'll be able to release information about who was awarded funds through the regular round um, ESG funding for 2020. And that's pretty much where we are right now. Uh, we will start the agreement contracting process uh, very quickly for the, those that were awarded in round one so we can get their agreements in place in order to start um, allocating those funds to them for, for their reimbursement. All right. Thank you, Heather and Shelley. Are there any questions that folks would like to ask of around ESG? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that input and that update. Um, there's a lot of stuff and a lot of moving parts, and you guys are doing a great job. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So. Hello. Hello. Yes, Charlie. Yes, Charlie. Yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. The deceased. The deceased. This the mic, I'm sorry, is, is creating a problem. A lot of feedback. Can you turn down your uh, your volume on your computer while you're talking? Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> where, where, where okay, is Okay, Charlie, just ask your question. Well, the question is...
All right, Charlie, you're back on mute. There you go. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, when this second round of funding is not going to fund shelter operations, and, and this is a conflict of interest in my comment because of room in the end. And here's the question. If you don't shelter, if you don't fund shelter operations, then you're finding people on the street under the bridge and you've got to be able to process that. Where is the where is the dynamic uh, plan of action to deal with people that you meet on the street, but, but you can't work through the shelters? It's just a comment. I can respond. I can respond to that, uh, Charlie. This is Heather from HUD TA. The so the second round has rapid rehousing and outreach funding in it, um, and so the outreach folks and the rapid rehousing folks are working together on strategies uh, to do exactly that, um, so that the folks that are outside, um, as many of them as we can, we can do that outreach as housing focus, so that they are funneled from those outreach folks um, into the rapid rehousing providers, uh, so that they are moving from outside uh, directly into housing with the housing first model. Thanks, Heather. Any other comments, questions before we move on? Yeah, and this is this is Shelly again. And just to clarify, you know, with the first round, um, the 1.39 million that was from the initial bucket, you know, a large portion of that was for operation type funding, a little bit of prevention, um, and then also you have operational funding that's going to be funded in the regular round. So we haven't completely forgone shelter operations. Um, so there is funding for shelter operations. It's just not the focus on the second round. Okay. Thank you, Shelly. Judy, did you have a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, one of the things, it's really been um, interesting to see the collaboration between all the stakeholders that have been happening. Uh, the facilitated, facilitated meetings, um, they've been uh, about weekly meetings. We have um, others lined up this week, one uh, today on outreach coordination, so everybody understands what kind of um, uh, different nonprofits are thinking about applying for and coordinating with each other. I have seen and we have observed um, partnerships, uh, people um, uh, making one agency be the applicant, uh, but then collaborate. You know, it's a combined uh, program that they want to run, so to make it seamless. One of the big questions that has um, early on uh, surfaced was about landlord uh, outreach. How is that going to be done? The concern about, okay, we have these fundings. If we go for um, rapid rehousing, do we have enough housing lined up to actually house people quickly? And so uh, there has been a lot of work to look at a model um, from Atlanta um, that's called Open Doors, and, and um, a really a shout out to uh, the mayor's office uh, to uh, bring them in to talk to this community. And there's a huge excitement at this point to learn more and really work towards uh, can we centralize, uh, have some assistance from an experienced organization um, to consult with us to come in and actually centralize, just focus on the landlord search so that um, the providers can focus on the service provision and working with people. And uh, so uh, there is a lot of conversation on that going on. Um, Heather, if you can jump in just a little bit uh, to explain um, uh, and, and help and, and with, with open doors. Um, uh, so we've all been in these conversations and really examined what, what it does. But there's a lot of excitement from the provider community about that. Sure, I'm happy to talk about the model. Um, Open Doors is a specific entity um, that, that uses this kind of model. And so as HUD doesn't, doesn't endorse any specific entity, but we what we do recommend uh, best practice models around landlord engagement um, and the model that that Open Doors is using is one of those models um, that is a is a centralized landlord system um, that is in a that includes real time inventory software, right? So that um, it isn't it isn't a cold call uh, all the time to see do you have units open? You know, is it an Excel spreadsheet that hasn't been updated in the last three months? Those kinds of things. 
it's real time software inventory about the properties that are available that accept various uh, subsidized funding streams. Like, for example, we had a demo yesterday. I was able to sit on a demo yesterday from them that um, showed various properties and attached to each property was this property does HUD bash, SSVF, uh, rapid rehousing, HCV, right? So um, another property did just uh, HUD bash, right? So it, depending on um, what they are, but that there's this real time inventory all in one place. Um, and that there are folks that their sole job is to monitor that inventory, make sure that it is up to date about availability, uh, to continue to increase that inventory and to maintain it when units are um, when in the in the in the case where someone moves on is evicted, those kinds of things that those staff people continue to help those units stay available um, for those funding streams, including uh, things like a, a rent bridge program, meaning that if a, if a someone does end up having to move for health reasons, ends up unfortunately being evicted, those kinds of things that that then the rent bridge dollars, which is private dollars, step in to basically hold that unit until the provider can move somebody back in or someone else from another funding stream that they accept that subsidized can move into that unit instead of it going back to the back to the private market. Um, so what it does is allow all the providers that are participating to see that inventory uh, for the coordinated entry system to see that inventory um, so that we are making referrals through coordinated entry to units that are actually available and not simply putting people on lists that go nowhere, right? And so when Sally said that we're continually updating coordinated entry, like that, it's great that y'all are talking about what you are. We're going to keep changing that too over the next few months um, about what that looks like so that it can connect to this real time process that isn't just about creating this big long list of people that need housing, but actually looking at what parts of this list and who on this list and what funding streams are available and what is a unit that someone can actually move into right um, and so a centralized landlord engagement system like this both expands the community's opportunity to participate in this with you by engaging more and more properties but it also allows you as providers to see all the same things at the same time um, so that while I know that you, many of you have your landlords, right? Uh, this really centralizes that so that there are there's a community based system that everybody can participate in, um, and it's a scalable process, right? And so, in a lot of communities, this starts with like one particular program, um, and then continues to evolve um, and includes however many programs want to participate in it, right? And and you kind of evolve that model with with the staff about how they, what funding streams, what properties, you know, those kinds of things, like including like managed care things when you, you know, if you have folks that need those kinds of things. But um, anyway, so that's the model. Um, and there is Open Doors Atlanta has has given a proposal to, to Nashville about how they could do that, um, that kind of model in Nashville. Um, but certainly the model itself is something that we would recommend um, for a comprehensive centralized real time way um, for y'all to have a more streamlined and efficient way to connect folks to housing. And this is a vision that we've had for years. It, we haven't gotten it off the ground here. It's just the resources haven't been here. Uh, they're still not here. So this is really critical. Um, um, I feel the stakeholders in the community want us to, this is would be a game changer. So. Um, but we really need to have an, a calls out for private funding foundations, some additional funding to really step up to make this happen. And this is something that can and, and needs to be built in a sustainable manner. Um, as you know, we at the Homeless Impact Division, we have Dion Trotter, um, who's doing a landlord engagement. We actually see um, new vendors that we are landlords paying moving costs to, uh, especially this year with COVID, uh, that we've seen that gone up. But it's not, we, we can't do this at the level that um, this open doors um, organization would offer. So this is a great opportunity to move towards and really look at, but um, we really need to go for that uh, funding and, and I hope we can make it happen. All right, thank you, Judy. In the interest of time, unless someone has something more pressing to say about uh, ESG, uh, I'd like to move forward, but want to make sure I give everyone a chance to say anything they feel like they need to say. Uh, is this program being proposed by the Atlanta project? Is so, yes, we have a proposal uh, before us. 
um, from the Atlanta Open Door um, to look at, we, we have examined it, we have presented it to the uh, service providers. Um, they have actually, they, that's kind of what got their excitement um, going. Uh, we, we looked at really, um, is it realistic? Is it doable? They have the expertise. So yes, that's in front of um, Nashville, um, depending on funding. How much Our, does it cost? It's uh, uh, the proposal is a three-year proposal, seven hundred thousand a year to really um, do that full proposal. That's the estimate right now. We're still looking at, um, you know, what, um, where do different funding pieces come in, or what could be um, in kind. But that's that's about the price tag. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, very much. I appreciate all of your work. Uh, and uh, Heather and Shelley uh, also appreciate your input and information. We're going to move forward now and talk about cold weather plan. Um, I believe Judy, is this you? Yes. Okay. So um, we at Metro had to adjust um, the cold weather proposal from. So as you know, Metro Social Services. Uh, is required uh, by an ordinance to submit a cold weather uh, proposal for what Metro is doing uh, by May 31st. So we have done that based on last year's approach, but with uh, an addendum that really explained that due to COVID, we, we will need to revisit that. So we have done that and the whole plan has been adjusted. Um, the cold weather shelter will be in a building in a separate room uh, at the fairground. So it's not within the existing uh, shelter that's going on, social distancing or COVID shelter that's going on there. It's a different uh, setup. It's a separate setup for people to uh, come in. Then it's still going to open at 28 degrees or below. Um, we encourage, again, everybody to use National Rescue Mission and utilize Women in the Inn Congregational Program first. Um, as you know, this is a part of an overall community program, um, especially we're working with the providers uh, to find out what they can do due to COVID and how they're going to set up. And every provider is working diligently on, on their piece of what it looks like for them this winter season. But the Metro Immediate Access Shelter is open, again, from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Capacity will be around 250 to 300 people. Um, outreach workers can call ahead and encouraged and really will be asked to call ahead before they drop somebody off so that staff can prepare um, for uh, the social distancing setup and, and really direct them where the entry is. Entry will be really clearly marked and how that works. Um, uh, we just want to see that there is some lead time. Drop-offs should be scheduled between 7 p.m. and 11.30 p.m., which is uh, a, uh, which is aligned with last year's um, walk-ups. We'll um, kind of, we, we're going to push for walk-ups up, walk between 7 and 11 p.m. As you know, a metro and other shelters as well, and it's that cold. Um, the National Rescue Mission as well take late drop-offs or, or even after these hours that I just cited. It's just really going to be a push to me, to um, get people settled once they're in so they can sleep and rest and, and take care of, of their um, uh, needs. Um, there were questions about if there is parking for vehicles at the fairgrounds. Yes, there is. But it's not going to be, it's set up in a similar fashion. Once you're in, it's not going to be complete um, in and out and in and out so people actually can sleep. That's based on past experience of what people want to happen. Um, this, um, let me go through my notes real quickly. Um, we are also uh, in the morning, people will be, or we, people will be informed if they want to stay long-term at the metro shelters, what the process is. And the process is that people need to get tested before they go over to the social distancing shelter. It's really for protection for everybody. So they would, they are immediately able then if they choose to stick around to enter the um, 
the isolation shelter, kind of where they can self-isolate, get tested, and then once they have a negative test, move over to the well site. They will have all that information. Um, the shelter is, as usual, it's for individuals, people with pets, couples. Um, and then families with children, we're working right now with OEM uh, to, and uh, the Salvation Army to figure out um, how we can uh, address when, when there are, every, every year we see a handful of families with minor children that cannot go to the mission. An example would be a dad with minor children. So we, we're trying to figure out how we can utilize um, uh, the Salvation Army and how, what support they need because uh, usually women in has always been able to step up, but due to COVID this year, it's really difficult for them to do so. So those are the um, main points. I will be uh, starting to post these on the website that we usually use, um, which is coldweathernashville.com. And uh, we also gonna do a lot of um, uh, early information, flyers and information to get people um, we are, I have a yeah and we're working with transportation as usual we have a partnership with we go to get people to that location since the fairgrounds is actually a new building so in past uh, years when the fairgrounds has been used it was quite a bit from the bus stop but now we have the experience with the shelters there people have no problem accessing that bus stop that is there right there so yeah that's kind of a highlight and the update all right thank you Judy um, moving on to committee updates uh, First committee update is the executive committee, which continues to meet and plan the agenda for this meeting. We have added two uh, new members to our executive committee, and I'm very excited to tell you that Laura Bermudez, who was instrumental in helping us create our strategic plan, has joined the executive committee. We think that's gonna be a great idea because she can help move that uh, process along uh, at that committee level, so we're excited about that. And Alex Smith has agreed to join the uh, executive committee. Alex has been involved in uh, the youth uh, grant that came in and has a lot of perspective and we really appreciate that. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, do we have a quick report from the data committee? Hi. Uh, so last summer the data committee, and can you all hear me? Okay. Last summer the data committee administered a survey to staff across COC member agencies. Um, the objective was to get an initial look at the diversity of the workforce and inform equity-based improvements, both in light of some of our internal goals and HUD in the overall field's focus on racial equity. So we asked respondents for demographic information, including race, gender, ability, and lived experience. And we also asked people about their perceptions of how well those working in homeless services reflected people served, um, perceptions of equity across hiring and advancement, and barriers and facilitators to participating in professional development opportunities and training. So we received 130 responses across 34 different agencies, and I'm gonna just share a few quick findings from the report. So the majority of respondents were white, that was 74% of frontline staff and 82% of senior management. Um, among different aspects of lived experiences that were asked about, 13% reported having lived experience with homelessness. And then to get a sense of diversity and representation beyond the limited sample of 130 folks who responded, we also asked people for their perceptions of the workforce. Um, and there was more agreement that frontline staff reflected the race, ethnicity, and lived experiences of people served than did staff in supervisory or management roles. Um, and then finally, on average, staff of color reported that there was less opportunity to move up or be promoted in their agency. Um, compared to white non-Hispanic staff who responded, and this difference was statistically significant. So um, based on these and other findings, the data committee drafted recommendations for member programs, committees, and the COC. And I'm gonna share just the broad areas of those recommendations, and there's more detail in the report. So number one, develop human resources, policies, and procedures around recruiting, hiring, retaining, and promoting people of color. To provide quality training for all staff related to equity, inclusion, and social justice. Three, integrate equity into community wide planning. So, um, for the purposes of the planning council today, I think two recommendations that we thought were worth emphasizing are um, number one, 
center people of color with lived experience and COC decision making. In addition to greater diversity in the planning council, inclusion and centering may mean ensuring equal or greater access to participate. So for example, on speaking time or in leadership opportunities. And then number two, for the community-wide planning recommendations were to segregate all COC level data. Um, so on coordinated entry, service use, resource allocation, COVID-19 rates, service and housing outcomes by race and ethnicity. So I know that was really quick. These were the high level um, findings and recommendations from the overall report, which is like, I think 10 pages or so. I'm gonna pass it on to Susie to talk about next steps to getting that out to you all and to the community. Thanks, Molly. Um, I, I'm, I just sort of uh, off the top of my head thought that we needed to distribute the report as it's finalized to the listserv so that the whole body of the folks who might be interested are able to sort of read through that. Post it on the um, Homeless Impact Division's website as well as on MDHA's website and then refer the report and its recommendations along to relevant committees including the Equity Committee, the Consumer Advisory Board, and the Standards of Care Committee, um, and just wanted to see if there were any questions that folks had and any other advice about where to send the report and what to do with its findings and its recommendations. Thank you, uh, Molly and Susie. Do we have any questions, concerns, thoughts, comments, su suggestions? Um, this is Elena. I just want to thank Molly and Ambeshin and her team. Um, they really put a lot of work into this. Um, and so we talked about it at the data committee and it's just a really um, great set of recommendations. So we really hope that you guys can um, find some, some use in those. But thank you, Molly. Thank you, Elena. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have a development report? I think that was the same item. Oh, workforce development report. Ah, I see that. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> All right. All right, then. Do we have any other business before we adjourn? We actually uh, we did really well. It's 10.01. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to say one more thing. Go ahead, Charlie. First of all, I want to congratulate you, Paula, on your new position. And secondly, Thank I you. think that something major is is at work in this Atlanta project, even though we haven't talked about it, except a, a report, brief report, it, it really shifts the whole notion of development from depending on the philanthropic community, which is drying up, where homeless projects uh, in the philanthropic community are at the bottom of the list. This shifts uh, our development from the philanthropic community to the real estate community. And it's creative, it sounds like it's creative and we need to look at it more, more uh, seriously. And then finally, we haven't heard from the mayor's office in this meeting. It'd be nice to have that voice on the agenda. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Anything else? Any other business? I have one comment really fast. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think earlier it was asked if, um, if we should have the COC general meeting. It might be a good idea to have it to talk about the cold weather plan, make sure people have a chance to think that through. Um, and I would love to hear what Molly just presented also presented to the general COC. Yes, I think that's a great idea um, for the general COC membership meeting. Um, Susie, I'm going to let you take that note and we'll make that agenda for next week. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Great. All right. Anything else? Any other business before we move to adjourn? All right. I once again want to say thank you very much for everyone. We had almost, almost, just for a couple of people, uh, everyone here today, which I think is great. Appreciate that. I want to once again say thank you to Hannah Davis for being being with us today as the official liaison to the mayor's office. Hannah, is there anything you want to say to us before we before we jump off this call today? 
No, I'm just grateful to get all of these updates. These meetings are incredible, um, how much content and data is shared. And um, in response to Charlie's comments, would be happy to be on the agenda going forward um, and can certainly provide any update. If the uh, council has anything that they'd like to consistently hear from our office, um, certainly let us know so that I can have the, that information prepped for the meeting, but otherwise I can um, absolutely provide a general update from our office and then um, as well as the rest of sort of the housing continuum so that we can um, continue to take advantage of um, that, that overlap between my work and, and all of your work so we can sort of bridge that gap, um, especially I think as tools like Open Doors are coming in that will potentially bring value across the housing spectrum. Um, it'll be great to, of course, we wanna see people be able to move um, into housing, but then of course, uh, what are long-term housing solutions for our city, um, you know, all the way across the income spectrum. So again, thank you for uh, having me here. And again, happy to be on the agenda going forward. Okay, thank you, Hannah. I also wanna say that Mary Falls is with us today. She has been, uh, working with us for quite a while now and want to uh, thank Mary for her input uh, over the last few months, particularly you know through COVID and all the things that have happened uh, in our city since then. And I see Mary, you actually have your hand up. Would you like to uh, make a comment? Thanks, Paula, and thanks to everybody who's participating. Just following up on Charlie's uh, question, um, I'm wondering if it, we would be happy to put together a call next week uh, for all the members of the Homeless Planning Commission uh, to connect them with open doors so people can have any questions answered. I think quite a few of you have already participated in some calls with them and uh, the feedback has been um, overwhelmingly positive, um, but happy to put together another call next week. Our feeling is that this is really Nashville's best chance in our lifetimes to really begin to end homelessness in Nashville. Uh, this is the missing piece and we're very excited about it. And um, we need to do pedal to the metal to get folks housed before winter. So we're, we are really feeling pressure to, to keep things moving quickly. Mary, I think that's a fabulous idea. And would you would you please work with Judy uh, on potentially setting up a time to do that? It, it, if it's the whole planning council, it'd have to be a publicly noticed meeting. But I, I would love, I personally would love to hear more about it. Uh, in more detail, and I know we can't. That'd be great. And Judy's been um, um, amazing and awesome. very grateful to her and her team in being super responsive. Actually, I, I, I couldn't have said it better, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, and I see Derek Smith wants to make a comment. He's our Metro legal representative and we'll get Derek in. And if we have nothing else, we'll we'll adjourn after that. Derek. Paula, I apologize. I thought I turned my hand off. I was That's just okay. wanting to point out that Mary had her hand raised in oh. case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just getting, you know, it, it's really hard Thanks, to Derek. keep up with stuff that goes uh, up and down. I have to keep scrolling up and down my little sidebar to see if people raise their hand, but I appreciate that. Um, sure. And okay. So if there is no other uh, issues, comments, questions, or thoughts that people have, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. Wendell, do I have a second? Second. Second by, was that who? Elena? Michelle. 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 Second by Michelle. Uh, all in favor, uh, please leave the meeting. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Great work. Again, congratulations, Paula. And Thanks. welcome back, Will. Thank you, brother. Take care. All right. Good to see you, Will. Thank you. Good to see you.